For those of you who don't know me, my name's Larky Condolis. I'm the Head of Strategic Projects here at uh, Flinders New Venture Institute. We're really excited to um, welcome Energy Lab and, um, have a, and develop this partnership, and this is our first event of quite a few. Um, the format today will be a 45-minute panel discussion with the opportunity to ask questions at the end. The panel members consist um, of Tonsley's own Philip Dortel, uh, Hilary Newstead, Program Manager with Cymec Energy, uh, Matthew Jeffries from Flinders University, our Sustainability Manager, Dr Burkhard Seaford, uh, Principal Engineer of Transformation at Oz Minerals, Sam Crafter, Director of Wood Street Partners, and our Moderator and um, Chairman of Procedures is uh, Piers Grove, who's the Chair and Co-Founder of um, Energy Lab. So I'm going to hand over to Piers to talk a little bit about Energy Lab and then get into the panel discussion. So. Thanks, Lucky. Um, yeah, I'm Piers Grove, I co-founded and chair Energy Lab. Um, I just want to take a moment to tell you what the heck Energy Lab is. Uh, we're a not-for-profit that we started up in Sydney uh, just under three years ago. And our mission is to help entrepreneurs who want to start the, the clean energy and advanced energy companies of the future. We try to give them the support and resources they need to build their businesses. Um, at our core, we have a flagship acceleration program where we, we take in around 15 to 20 uh, startups a year and we give them access to capital, uh, tutoring, mentoring, a whole bunch of workshops. Uh, we have a $26 million sidecar fund that's there uh, to invest in those businesses really early on. Um, and we, we work around Australia. We try to take a, a holistic view of the market and to try to put the right startup in the right place to, to be able to trial and test their technology. Um, these events are a really important part of what we do at Energy Lab because they're a chance to engage and start the conversation and find the people who are interested in this area um, with a view to Energy Lab working with the New Venture Institute to get up and running and supporting entrepreneurs here, both locally but also bringing them in from around Australia and around the world. We also operate in other markets around the world, so we've got a, a, a good operation in Cambodia, which allows Australian entrepreneurs to go up there and do things which might be microgrids or much smaller scale um, for, for emerging markets that are looking for that leapfrog opportunity. We're in Japan where we're trying to look at how Australian technology can get in there with the, with the demise of, of nuclear. Um, so this evening's panel is really the beginning of that conversation around what, uh, what are the things and the opportunities in the South Australian market and where does innovation and startups fit into that. So that being said, I'd love to um, get our panel to introduce themselves. I'm going to sit down uh, and kick it off. Can we start with you, Matt? So, thanks, Biz. Um, so my name's Matthew Jeffrey. I'm the Sustainability Manager here at Flinders University. So um, I'd like to also welcome you to Flinders at Tonsley. Um, we're really, really proud of this, this building. When we were designing it, we set a, a target to achieve a 50% reduction in operational greenhouse gas emissions from the building. And, and once it was constructed, we went through a, a fairly rigorous 12-month um, monitoring and verification process and we're able to get really close to that 50% um, that target, getting, getting, uh, getting it to 48%. So this, this building's really driven, um, designed for a lot of our other buildings at our other campus at Bedford Park and will also um, dictate, I suppose, the principles that we look at when we're, we're designing and constructing our health and research medical building at the, the new Flinders Village. Um, where the new train will be arriving down near the Flinders Medical Centre, so. Okay, thank you. And Phil, Tonsley Park. Great. So my name is Philip Dautl, I'm the Tonsley Precinct Director, and maybe just to put in context for those who don't know that uh, uh, up until 2008, this was a place where cars uh, were made, and after a bit of a thinking period of what shall we do with a uh, 61 hectare precinct, uh, vacated, partially contaminated asbestos in the roofs. Um, the idea was that uh, the government purchased the land back from Mitsubishi and investing $250 million to redevelop the site, uh, expecting $1 billion 
uh, industry investment to come on top of, or private investment to come on top of that, and this building alone was, I think, 120. So <laughs> the numbers are uh, already um, coming together. Um, and this is pretty much how the site works, is that we have um, a 61 hectare precinct. Uh, TAFE SA is on one end of this MAB, the main assembly building, which you may have seen already. Uh, Flinders University with this amazing facility here. And then we have a mix of, uh, you know, from the one-man bands in the, in the co-working spaces and the startups um, to the scale-ups um, in the main assembly building, uh, businesses up to uh, 30, 50 people, and then uh, um, reaching to 120, 130 um, people, businesses um, such as Sage Automation, um, Zeiss, and, and, and the likes. So it's a, a very um, amazing precinct that uh, you're in today, and uh, lots of activity. And um, to put in context, as much as I don't want to get lost on job numbers, but um, the last thousand, thousand workers were made redundant in 2008, um, while Mitsubishi had, um, Australia is still headquartered here with 130 people. But what we've achieved now is a much more resilient precinct um, in in having around 1,700 people now uh, coming here for work and uh, around six, 7,000 students coming through the site each year uh, with TAFE SA and Flinders Uni. So, um, yeah, good, good place to do stuff, which we'll talk about in a minute. <laughs> Thank you. Sam, do you want to tell us about Wood Street? I won't ask you to explain the name again, um, but also a little bit on yourself and your background. Yeah, sure. So uh, um, I've come out of government uh, about a month ago. I was leading the energy implementation team in the Department of Energy and Mining. So our team was uh, lucky enough to be able to work on the energy plan through 2017 and then the, the new government's energy program. So home battery scheme, grid scale storage fund, renewable tech fund, uh, building the generation in the lead up to the 2007 and 18 summer Hornsdale Power Reserve were some of the projects that we worked through. Uh, and so uh, having done that and, and worked closely on that for um, a period of time, decided to take the leap and, uh, and go and start a, a my own business with a colleague. Um, and, uh, and so we're out looking to help people with their energy problems, I guess, at that sort of uh, larger scale. Um, we've done a lot of different projects from negotiation design all the way through to building an owner's team for people and, and, and getting things done. So that's sort of what we're about. Um, obviously tonight, I guess I'll tap into a fair bit of my experience over that time in government as well and try and bring some of that perspective into the mix. Excellent. It must be nice not to be in a government role. For <laughs> you can speak your mind tonight. Yeah, it'll be interesting, won't <laughs> it? It should be really interesting. Uh, Burkhard from uh, Oz Minerals. Yeah, um, my name is Burkhard. Welcome. Um, it's fantastic to be here tonight. Um, I work at Oz Minerals as principal engineer transformation. Transformation is a new function that Oz Minerals has established. Um, it's about finding new ways how we operate, how we can differentiate us, um, and how we find um, new opportunities along the way. We have got a horizon of five to ten years um, where we look at opportunities. We have got a mixed focus on how we actually do things and what we are focusing on, um, and it is a really fascinating place to be in. Um, my background, my educational background is mechanical engineering, and during my studies I found that well, great products are fantastic, but they're useless if you don't have a great business model behind it. And that's when I um, established my passion for entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial management. Um, so I took every opportunity I could uh, find to develop those skills. And I actually was um, lucky to be part of a, um, um, a center which is very similar to NVI and Energy Lab, um, which supported young entrepreneurs in their thinking and, and, and what, what they're doing. And that has changed my mind and changed the way how I, or changed my career. Because soon after, um, I started my own energy technology company, and we were focusing on energy projects in developing countries. And that was a fa fantastic opportunity for me. Um, after a couple of years, I was um, excited to see another opportunity. So rather than being an entrepreneur and starting a new company, I was wondering 
how would it be if I could be within a company and change the way how people operate and think and be a little bit influential on the culture, like being an entrepreneur. And that's how I ended up here in, in Australia. And I'm glad and fortunate that I have got this role with those mules now where I can do exactly that. Oh, thank you. And lucky last, Hilary from Simic. Hi, I'm Hilary from uh, Simic Energy, where I look after uh, demand response programs for our customers. So uh, Simic Energy is a developer and uh, retailer of renewable energy here in South Australia and, and looking to grow more broadly across the country. Um, we're, we're part of the broader GFG Alliance, um, which Sanjeev Gupta is our, our chairman and, and I guess, cover, cover post boy for, for <laughs> the sustainable industry of the future. Um, so he's looking to use re renewable energies as part of Cymec Energy as a way to redevelop Wyella and the steel industry down there. Um, and then I guess as part of that, with our other commercial industrial customers that we retail energy to, I'm looking to um, really use technology as a way to help, help maximise the benefit for both us um, in terms of delivering low cost energy to our customers. Um, but also, also for our customers as a way to improve their energy productivity, really. So uh, maxi maximising the ways that they can uh, not, not necessarily, uh, I, I guess, energy efficiency really looks at reducing kind of output. So we're really looking at improving productivity at, at the same time as reducing energy consumption for our customers. Um, my background um, has been kind of across both the energy sector, the telco sector, and, and in the consulting space. So I ha have about 15 years' experience across energy in Australia, um, but in all sort of different gamuts, all sort of related to the technology side of, of the piece. Yeah. Fabulous. Thank you. To, to, to kind of begin the conversation, I'd, I'd love to get uh, your views, Hilary, and, and also your insights, Sam, from government around... I guess from, from, a, from Sydney, we look and we see so many interesting things that have occurred in this market over the last sort of 10, 10 15 years. Um, where is the South Australian energy market up to? Is it, is it working well? Is it, is it functioning as it should? Are there still challenges that need to be addressed? Um, Hilary, do you want to jump yeah, in? Yeah, happy to start. Um, I was speaking to someone the other day from uh, Dubai, I think, is where he's based at the minute, but someone who's in the European energy market, and he was uh, calling me to ask about what was happening in the South Australian energy market. So mm -hmm. that, that goes to show how much kind of global interest this market in particular gets um, in, terms of, in terms of what's happening here, because it is so interesting yeah. um, in comparison to what's happening elsewhere. Um, I'm Melbourne-based, I'm not, not a South Australian person, but do watch, watch from afar and, and with great interest. So... <laughs> Kind. Um, so I guess in terms of where it's at today, I think the market is working. You know, our market mm -hmm. is designed to ultimately um, continually try and balance supply and demand, and and that is happening today. It happens in a in a more volatile way than what it seems to in the eastern states, where there's still a lot more. Um, kind of old incumbent thermal generation in the market, you know, the Loyangs of the world that are sitting there steady, running at the same capacity most of the time until they break down, um, which has happened at the, the minute world. and it happens more and more often. Um, over here, I think South Australia is, is more progressed in terms of the, the change and diversity of the generation assets in the market. And that, that does create volatility, which takes time for everything to adjust back to that equal, equilibrium point. You can't just, um, you know, it's not just a, a one change to one response. It's an ongoing change in response um, to the point where even this week, um, you know, the, the market prices have been volatile here in South Australia, I think, on... I think it was Tuesday, um, you know, a cold day. There was not a lot of wind. There was some generation out in, in Victoria, which would generally feed over here as well. Um, so, you know, prices went as high as $5,000 a megawatt hour in the wholesale market. Mm. Um, that does still happen. The next day, the prices sat at a negative level for almost the entire day because it got windy. Um, and that's just what happens when you're relying on more natural resources as a way to... Mm. to generate your energy. Um, that's not to say it's a bad thing at all, um, but it's not something that's instantly going to adjust to everything um, without that reliability in the market. Um, so I think it is working. Um, I, I think, you know, politicians and everyone expect there to be an immediate outcome and immediate stability. Um, I think, 
you know, the opportunity for innovation and investment in the South Australian market is great. It's a, it's a great test bed to figure out how to help, you know, firm up that, that um, I guess, volatility in the market through things like the Hornsdale battery. Um, we're in the process of developing a utility scale battery as well um, as a way to firm our other renewable assets that we're looking to bring into the market. So, yeah, I think, I think it's working, but mm -hmm. it's, it's not an immediate answer. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sam, just in, in, kind of going on from that, where, uh, where are still the gaps that need to be addressed to kind of get it humming? Yeah, so I think, um, I think the, the issue is the, the system strength issues associated with the mix, um, which pose the challenges. Um, so there's, a, there's an interesting, uh, sort of the engineering and the market piece are both an interesting space. Um, the cracking that sort of uh, market model around being able to firm the cheap renewables in an affordable way, getting that mix of generation right uh, is something that I think obviously is, is where the, the retail sector is after and, and the South Australia probably has an advantage with the amount of renewables that, that getting that right and testing that here is I think a really good opportunity and I think that's what a lot of the companies like Symec and, and others are looking to do uh, and that brings with it investment as well and, and looking at that. And, Having tackled some of these problems first, I think South Australia um, is ending up with a, a, a generation mix that might be, you know, diverse enough to sort of start to co to, to grapple with that. So you've got large-scale storage. Um, there's a lot of push around um, home storage systems to help soak up some of the solar. Um, then you've got a, a range of pump storage projects. I know Simic has one, and there's I think four or five others that are all in a in a contest, if you like, or, or Path, rushing through the development pathway to sort of get to, to development. So if you, that's a longer term storage. So then if you're looking at covering some of the bases of storage uh, and if you're able to contain some of the gas in the mix to be able to manage that and, and firm some of that out, South Australia looks like a more dynamic, um, diversified generation mix, which I think is exciting. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's on the journey to that. It's not there yet. Um, and so I think... Yeah. Is that diversity, was that a strategic decision to have this level of diversity of asset? Or was it just the way the market responded to to the changes? I think it was. Um, I think big challenges provide opportunities, and yeah. that's what's happened. And some of that has been. I mean, fundamentally, some of the shifts that we're seeing. And I think the East Coast is following fast behind. But um, when people are paying um, high prices for electricity, you get a reaction from politicians because that that they start to hear that very quickly and therefore that ends up with governments taking more of an interventionist role. The energy plan work that we did was designed as best we could to, um, to intervene without intervening. So to, to make change without actually discouraging investment from the industry into the sector. So there's a real balancing point there and it's a very hard thing to sort of manage and I'm not sort of suggesting that everything's been done perfectly well. But I do think from the energy plan perspective a couple of years ago, You've seen things like the Renewable Tech Fund, which led to Hornsdale Power Reserve, the VPP project that's there, the Home Battery Scheme, again, and the Grid Scale Fund, which is still under evaluation, as far as I understand, in government. But again, the premise on which that was based was we've got the next challenge we have is around this sort of system strength. And if you look at the, the ISP that was put out, that was the thing that there wasn't really... It continued to deteriorate in South Australia, according to that report from AMO. So what the government asked for in terms of investment was not just a storage project, but storage projects that could help contribute to solving that problem. So the government had a $50 million lever to try and support projects, and it said, we'll support your project if you can help us fix that problem. So there's been a little bit of strategy towards mm. some of that, but I don't think anyone would pretend that sort of 10 years ago they said, oh, we're going to end up with a mix like this and it's going to help us solve the... It's been, yeah. One of the most aspirationally named organisations in Australia has to be the national. Is the idea of a national energy market? It's like someone <laughs> declared this thing to be, and now it's coming, come, slowly trying to catch up. Um, where does South Australia fit into the idea of a national energy market? Is that seen as something that would strengthen the South Australian market or build opportunity for the South Australian market? I mean, I think. Your fundamental point is right. If you're starting to design a national energy market, you wouldn't start from here. And, uh, you know, because what you would do is you'd capitalise on the resource where it is and then disperse that in the best way you can around the country. So heavily renewable resources and the ability to share those into the East Coast, 
to balance that out with the, the more traditional you know, fossil fuel generation that we've had and trying to get that mix right across the national energy market would be the desired way of doing it. And uh, unfortunately, the development of those different um, generation sources over time, uh, the lack of interconnection um, investment over time, well, really, interconnectors have been invested based on an investment decision at that point in time. And that's a very difficult thing to be able to, to forecast. So it's a bit hard to say, oh, well, it would have been great to have had interconnection everywhere. Um, but equally, if we had have had some sort of mechanism to invest in a longer term frame, I think we probably would have helped to fix some of, some of those challenges. In, interconnection obviously is uh, seen as a solution by the current government. And I think that um, that could potentially enable some of the renewables to move across uh, the border and potentially vice versa. I think New South Wales is very interested in that from the transition away from Liddell when that closes. Um, I'm not sure how the modelling in all these. We've got another things, year or two out of Liddell now. No, no, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> bit but more I mean, sticky tape. I think that where you get to is um, if you're sitting in New South Wales looking at the modelling, it looks like it works really well because the energy comes in your direction. If you're sitting in South Australia, there's a modelling case that comes through and says all the energy is coming in your direction. Um, it's obviously not going to go in both directions. So it'll be interesting to see how that works in in practice. I think, uh, mm. and the timing, of course, is a is going to be very interesting because the the risk is that the the interconnector will be under development and therefore not factored into any of the market or pricing, uh, but industry will stop investing potentially in the generation that they have in South Australia until they understand what the impact of the interconnector is. And, and not having that existing kit renewed and investment continuing, I think poses a bit of a challenge. And so the timing around this is, is gonna be interesting. So. Mm. The other thing just on opportunities, just yep. quickly to put one out there is I think hydrogen is very exciting. I know it's, it's um, becoming a bit of a flavour of the month, but I think there's reasonably strong grounds for that. Yep. Um, particularly in South Australia, we've got a lot of coincident wind and solar located, which helps a lot with getting a hydrogen project up with the efficiency rates. And so I think there's some real opportunities and some significant investment going into some projects with the support of some of the, the renewable tech fund was the first one. Um, and so that's one side of it from South Australia. But the other thing is nationally, um, Alan Finkel is leading that strategy for COAG. And I think before the end of the year, there'll be a national hydrogen strategy. Yes. If I had to predict, I think that'll get through. Hydrogen doesn't have the baggage of other, it sort of weaves its way through that debate between renewables and fossil fuels that gets so ugly in the federal space. I think there's a pathway that that could be something that there's a, sort of the states unite around and the federal government as well. Uh, and in that regard, you've got pretty um, strong markets in Japan and Korea that are looking to shift a lot of their energy towards that as an opportunity. And uh, and it's uh, they've made those decisions completely independent. So the question is, is there a green hydrogen solution that South Australia can get as opposed to other hydrogen forms around the rest of the country as well? Um, it's uh, it's going to be interesting to see. Mm -hmm. Um, certainly, hydrogen is is definitely the the answer to so many questions that uh, you sometimes feel that it's just being used to to say yes, and that's where that goes, and the excess capacity. But implementing it as an industry is is is, is quite a challenge. Um, I'm going to kind of zoom in a little bit and draw you in here, Matthew, around Flinders, because uh, you mentioned before we started that you're reviewing your energy procurement and, and strategy toward the end of next year, wasn't yeah. it? I, mean, I can only imagine the change from the last time you did that to now. What, as a large, I guess, traditional consumer of energy, how does that change this time around and what are your priorities as an organisation? Yeah. Um, so we, uh, we reviewed our sustainability plan recently and um, went out to our our broader community and asked a lot of questions about what their expectations were from us as a large consumer of, of energy and, and overwhelmingly they, they said that they wanted us to, um, to, to generate our own renewable energy <laughs> on site as much as possible. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of our focus in the last couple of years has been around, you know, where can, how can we optimise the amount we generate and then the, um, the, what we'll need therefore then from the, the network. And what are the characteristics of that energy that we get from the network? So mm. they also said um, they want us to become carbon neutral. Um, you just got a wish list. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, no, it was good, it was good, it was good. Um, they were very clear. Um, so, you know, it's, it's our role uh, as supporting them from a research and educational perspective to, to deliver on, you know, what they want 
from us mm -hmm. as, a, as a large consumer. So, you know, we have, we have this vision to be carbon neutral. We want to get to a point where um, our electricity is sort of net zero emissions, and that's to coincide with our next retail agreement. And we've set a sort of a, a figure of around 30% uh, energy from renewables on site. Um, but given we've got a 168 hectare campus, two kilometres up the road, and we've got a lot of space, we've built um, you know, um, significant sized renewable energy um, power plants over car parks, mm -hmm. on our buildings. So there, there's a huge opportunity, I think, there for us to, to further invest on site. Yep. And, and I think I like the, this concept of the virtual power plant as well, because I think there's an opportunity there for us to, to, um, to do as much generation as we can, even though it might be more than we need. Um, but is there an opportunity for us to partner with others and look at providing you know, our broader community, whether it be a staff and students, with a, a packaged up sort of retail energy deal that's yeah. you know, um, just been generated down the road by the organisation they work for or, or, or study at. So, um, and we want to further demonstrate our value as a, as a university to the community in which, which we serve. So I can, I can imagine that the amount of solar that you, you can deploy is great. Are you also putting in storage and, and trying to participate in that wholesale market or is it more just through a, a retail relationship? Um, yeah, we're, we're currently doing a lot of work in that space to understand what's best, best for the uni. Um, our, as I said, our, our next retail deal finishes at the end of next year, so there's a going through a big process of doing some internal capability building with, with our finance and other teams to, to look at the uh, array of arrangements that are in the market now and, and what's you know, going to um, suit our level of risk. And you know, We ultimately have to maintain this um, expensive research equipment mm. uh, for, for our researchers, so you know, it, we've got that front of mind. Um, but, yeah, really scaling up to, to, to basically secure deals and arrangements that, that deliver on our sustainability plan. This may be one step removed from you, but are the students engaged and interested in driving this, or is it more the university's leadership? Uh, it's a mix of both. Obviously, um, students are very busy now studying, mm -hmm. and they've also typically got jobs as well. So. Uh, we want to build their campus experience to keep them on campus for as long as possible, mm -hmm. um, but but you know that they, they are they are very very busy. Um, so so they do they do engage through these formal processes we have and consultation yep. and the like. But um, I just noticed we um, we put some solar shelters in for our open day or open weekend this this weekend, and um, we had students sitting in them charging their devices and. It went on to went on to social media and uh, keeping Snapchat going. Yeah, like it was. We got some really great feedback. You know, it, it's, it's um, you know it's understandable they want spaces to sit and yeah. in the sun and charge your devices. But um, you know, uh, we are we are doing some projects like that where we're integrating solar panels into walkways and shelters and then putting mm -hmm. in um, charging and and for them. So just just making them um, stay on campus for a bit longer. Yep. Eat and drink, and um, and um, do what they need to do to get their degree. Cool, yeah. um, Phil. If I can bring you in, because you've got a different set. You've got a new set of toys with Tonsley in many ways. How has how has this area been set up uh, to generate and consume energy? What sort of interesting things are here? Well, I guess the sorry. Um, if we go back a step, and that's sure. why I made a bit of a longer introduction, is. When you hear, when you open the newspaper, what is the, the current sector of interest? Um, um, it's a lot you hear about the space and, and, and such areas there. Now you go back to the time when Mitsubishi was about to develop, 2008, 2010, and the flavor of the month at that point was this zero carbon, um, uh, climate, climate neutral, all that thinking. So the, the clean tech renewable was really sort of on the rise, and I think, um, or not, I think, the reason why we have this um, sustainability in our DNA is because that's where the seed was planted, and I think that's where we, um, not just doing it from a toy and playing kind of uh, perspective, but since then uh, has been uh, probably the key pillars, um, as much as collaboration is a key pillar of our core DNA, 
uh, for Tonsley, which is really important to understand where it's all came from. So the idea was not just to create a precinct uh, which operates in key sectors and clean tech renewable being one of them, um, and not finishing by trying to attract uh, clean tech renewable companies in the precinct, um, but also being an exemplar uh, of Tonsley overall. And that led us to um, interesting projects. And the things, the reason why they're interesting is, and that's why I made this longer intro as well, is um, basically it is a nice playground or test bed. Um, you think of Tonsley, it's like a mini city. We have, uh, since the last four weeks, the first residents uh, living in uh, Tonsley, as part of Tonsley Village, uh, product by Pete. Um, we have uh, light industrial, we have academia, we have roads, we have bits of everything, but the status is still private land. So it's private land with public access. And that allows us to do things you can't do probably elsewhere in, in such simple ways. And, and that's why you see autonomous pots running around here on the public roads or under the map. Um, so any of those future trends we can actually um, demonstrate here. And um, while we're demonstrating things, uh, we driving innovation or innovation as part of the uh, tons of redevelopment ourselves, and I think the the key one that is currently um, being rolled out is the um, district energy scheme or district water energy and water scheme uh, delivered by N-Wave um, with the announcement recently of Zen Energy um, supplying the um, solar panels on the uh, beautifully north-facing map roof to begin <laughs> with, um, to also begin with a 30% uh, renewable energy target uh, into that, but also then um, in, a, in a microgrid setup, um, but also then hydrogen flavor, other flavor of the month is uh, uh, getting some of that into the uh, electrolyzer to produce green hydrogen on site with a small 1.25 megawatt uh, electrolyzer. Um, but then what becomes the Australia first, as much as we like these headlines, is injecting a 5% blend into the natural gas pipeline okay. for the on-site uh, Mitchell Park community, which was announced four or five weeks ago, um, to decarbonize uh, the community as much as you may have uh, a refueling station for your next uh, fuel cell cars or um, garbage trucks, whatever comes down that track, um, or simple storage in industrial uses and, and export in a the, in the larger scale, which is another area um, which um, I think 14 million so far has been invested in, in, in this hydrogen. Um, so there's uh, not just, we're not just uh, a place that has uh, leading clean tech renewable companies on site. Uh, we want to demonstrate that as a project as well. And I think that's the, um, that's the, uh, you know, the cool thing about this place, I guess. <laughs> are you being driven by the the tenants and, and projects that they're looking to do, or are you trying to bring in projects and then socialise them and get 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 other participants on board? So with something like the hydrogen, did that come from you, or did that come from somebody who wanted to do it and this was the right yep. spot? Okay, so put it this way: um, there's. We less so own the project ourselves, but um, part of our role is to uh, lobby to get those interesting projects into the precinct. Um, or having a partnership with uh, Os Minerals, which you might be uh, talking about in a minute as well. If you think about um, the, the, I mean, we operate in, in four key sectors, clean tech renewable being one of them. The other one is uh, the med tech space, uh, software simulation automation, and the mining energy services. But if you are a place like Tonsley, it's not just trying to get the next business into the site. And as part of my role is indeed to grow the precinct, uh, to go uh, beyond the 1700 where we are now, um, to ideally at peak times of Chrysler times, which is about 6,500 people. Um, but the way to achieve that is not just attracting new businesses, but those who are on site, letting them grow. And yeah. the growth you can at least support. Um, you're not everybody's BDM, um, but what we're trying to do with those projects is actually exposing the local business community, um, uh, including Tonsley, but not exclusive to Tonsley in many ways, and in some cases you can't, <laughs> as much as you would like to perhaps. Um, but you see with the district energy scheme delivered by N-Wave, um, um, Zen is involved in that, as automation on site is involved in that, so the local content certainly plays a role. If that answers your question. Yes, yes, most certainly. Mm. Um, 
While we're sort of looking at specific uh, challenges like, like Flinders and, and Tonsley, um, I guess from the perspective of Oz Minerals and also uh, Cymac, you, you've got new projects coming up, you've got new uh, requirements, and I guess you can't just plug into the grid to solve that. Uh, perhaps we start with you, Burkhard, around mm. your new mine and how you're trying to... Yeah fit in with the context, but also meet your own needs? So Oz Minerals is a copper gold miner. We've got one operating mine, Prominent Hill, and we are currently building another one called Carpatina. Both are in South Australia. Um, they will be all grid connected. Um, what we were finding is that renewable energy obviously poses fantastic new opportunities for us. Um, so we spoke about hydrogen, so there's one theoretic opportunity there and so on. So we want you to tap in, in these opportunities. And we understand that this is a game that is um, not easy. And we need to collaborate and understand what other players are doing and helping us to find new ways how we can operate and, and do the things we want to do. So we initiated something called energy mining collaboration. And, in it, and this collaboration is it's a new platform for collaboration between various parties. Um, we have got um, the, um, startup organizations, incubators, um, non, uh, for profit, non for profit companies, um, um, education, research organizations that are on the same journey. We want to understand demand management on the mind side, we want to improve it. Um, and to look at ways how we can maximize renewable energy for our operation. Um, so the energy mining collaboration helps us um, to gain knowledge from other industries, from other players in the market, um, and th th they challenge us, they should challenge us in the way how we, how we think. One key element is that we are building a hybrid energy system at Carapatina. It's going to be relatively small scale. It's acting as a test platform. We want to utilize it to plug in other technologies and test it. We want to develop hypotheses um, where we currently, or the industry probably, doesn't have an answer for. Um, when you look at hard, li hard, uh, large penetration of renewable energy, and then you look at the mine side, there are many uncertainties and unknowns that many people can't tell us, even the vendors and the um, experts. So you actually have to trial it. You have to find um, the answers. And so we want to open up um, this platform. We want to invite other organizations to play on, play on that, um, gain data and share the knowledge across the industry um, and with other players. So that, that's our objective. This is a, um, something very new. This is new for the industry. This is new for the minerals. Um, so you know, we're not saying we're getting it right the first time, but I think we're getting there. We're evolving. Um, we have got great partners. One of them is the Tons Innovation District. We have got CSRO being on board as well, um, and other organisations. And there are many other companies that have shown interest. And that is for me something fascinating that we are not alone in that. Um, we get great support from others. We have got. Um, others show interest, and that for me, if you treat it as, an, as a startup, like an MVP, mm. that would be a big tick for me, that there's a market, there are other players who say, yes, this is really important for us, and um, continue what you're doing. And is this level of um, collaboration uh, a, a, a newer approach to, to tackling energy, where you sit down in the room with lots of people with shared Absolutely. challenges? Absolutely. Um, in particular for us, Minos, um, this is a new way how we want to work. We want to develop an innovation culture so we, where we encourage our, our people, our vendors, um, everybody who works with us um, to innovate with us, to share new ideas, to challenge us, um, and to bring insights from other industry um, that we can apply within the mining industry. The mining industry is maybe a little bit like treats himself a little bit in isolation. I think there's a real fantastic opportunity to change that. Um, we have um, like the Carpatina mine, we had an, um, an innovation lab 
and actually Sam was, was part of that as well as, um, in his previous role, where we wanted just to engage with other people um, to share what we're doing um, and get the inside, their feedback at a really early stage so that we've got the ability to change the way that we would usually um, do things. Mm. Um, and, and Hillary, with Wyala and the, and the work you're doing there, that feels like a really interesting blend of, of different technologies. I guess what drove the desire to do something and think entirely afresh in that, in that market? I think it's uh, potentially the other end of the spectrum to Oz Minerals in that uh, we've just tried to take it all into our own hands, basically. Right. Um, so Sanjeev has, has a vision that he, he's replicating around the world in terms of creating a, a sustainable steel industry. It's one of the most energy intensive mm. industries that there is. Um, and as a result, One Steel was struggling to keep Wyala afloat um, at, because of the way the energy prices were going in South Australia is one of the big reasons. Um, and, and that was just making steel too expensive to sell um, in comparison to international steel prices. Um, so I guess Sanjeev was looking at, at the bigger picture of how do, you, how do you take control of the whole supply chain, the whole value chain, mm -hmm. to be able to create a, a viable product at the end of the day and keep um, industry essentially in Australia at a sustainable level. So um, that's, I guess, when, when he identified Zen Energy here in, here in South Australia as an opportunity to, um, I guess, develop that renewable capacity himself. Um, his, his vision is, is to create green steel, so to use renewable energy to, to sustain to sustain Wyala. So um, Cymec was really born out of that um, and, and our pipeline of projects, he, he's committed to investing a billion dollars um, to create, I think, a gigawatt of renewable energy in, in the local Wyala district. And that's, um, you know, in that area with the view that it is a supply constrained part of the grid. It's, you know, it's not near the biggest populations in mm. South Australia. So there was never going to be a huge, huge amount of power there. So what could he do to invest to be able to sustain his whole pipeline? Um, and so that's why we're, we're building Coltana Solar Farm, a 280 megawatt solar farm down there, and we're going through investment processes, final investment decisions for a utility scale battery in the same area to be able to firm our solar farm asset, and, and as mentioned earlier, a pumped hydro project as well, you, you know, making the most of our iron ore pits that we already have mm -hmm. um, to sort of close the loop and have both electricity and the storage capacity that we need to have a reliable power supply um, for, for the steel mill, yeah. It's, it's always easy to look at the generation side, but when you get up every day and look at, you know, the demand side as yeah. well, uh, how does that factor in when you're, you've got such a single-minded outcome as we need to be able to have enough energy to produce steel? Where does the demand response side fit into that? Um, Steel mill is a great example because it's got a terrible load profile. Um, so if you if you look at a like an electric arc furnace, so you're basically using electricity to uh, essentially melt s steel scrap, um, it's got about a 40 minute cycle that it runs on. So it draws huge amounts of electricity for 40 minutes. So I think it's over 100 megawatts of draw for that period of time, and then it stops. Um, so that's terrible from a network perspective in mm. terms of the, the fluctuation that you're having every 40 minutes. Um, so to look at it from the demand side, the more that you can pull into that network area and sort of constrain from the rest of the grid um, so that you're not having those huge voltage fluctuations across the whole grid. There's obviously a lot of people who live in Wyala who don't want to deal with that kind of uh, volatility on, on the grid. Um, yeah. th there's a and lot. And we're in darkness for yeah, 40 minutes. For, for the next 15 minutes yeah. until we turn it back on. Um, so that's definitely a consideration. Um, and then just, you know, having the flexibility on the demand side to be able to adjust other things at those times of, of fluctuation so that you can essentially end up with a flat line. Um, mm. You know, something goes up, something goes down. Um, I think it's important to look at both the supply and the demand side to continue to sustain that equilibrium, whether it's at, at the local level or at the distribution level or at, at a state level as well. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, I think this is an area where um, demand response can occur in in really big ways, you know, turning a, an aluminium smelter on or off, but it can also happen with fine-tuning an HVAC system and things like Absolutely. that. Absolutely, yeah. Um, 
are you seeing, uh, is it difficult to approach that uh, spread of opportunity and is there opportunities in there for startup companies and, and, and smaller players to contribute to an aggregate whole? Yeah, absolutely. So um, literally right at the minute we're, we're looking at our whole customer portfolio where um, by, by volume of sites, most of our customers are commercial buildings where, where one of the biggest opportunities is around HVAC and, and yeah. fine-tuning that or pre-cooling buildings on hot days and those sorts of things, um, which is tough to do manually. So, you know, we've done demand response trials over the past summer where we've looked at things like turning on diesel generators to, to limit um, load on the grid and things like that, but that requires, you know phoning up saying, hey, for the next four hours, can you go walk out the back, turn on your generator, cut over from the grid, those sorts of things. Once you start to look at a bigger portfolio, you, you really need technology to be able to enable that um, and to be able to both measure and verify that you've actually delivered the response that you thought you were going to get. Um, so we're at the minute talking to a whole lot of technology providers who do exactly that. Um, so... Um, essentially looking to see how we can tap into as many of our customers as possible. We've got a, a diverse range of customers from um, your local IGA right up to a mine site and everything in between. Um, so there's not really a one-size-fits-all solution to demand response, but if, if technology is adaptable enough, it is around just control logic at the end of the day to be able to, to, be able to identify and control that energy flexibility. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay, this is a question for, I think, everyone except Sam. Um, <laughs> yeah, cool. Uh, how, when you've got a problem, whether it's as a, as a precinct or a university or a mine, how do you engage with the market to find out what options are out there and, um, and, and integrate and work with these sort of disparate players? Uh, so anyone who's kind of had to do some interesting procurement and partnerships in the energy space. Well, I guess for Tonsley it was, and being government-led, um, you cannot just go on a pub and, you know, oh, yeah, I like this, come on, let's do the project. Um, so there's a, 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 you know, very clear procurement process involved in that. Um, what, what the district energy scheme does is um, there was an open process and... Um, NWAVE Australia is now delivering that project, but NWAVE themselves have the ability to pull in all the tech and things in a much uh, simpler way than going through the government. And that's why we've sort of taken this out of our hand and placed into um, that organisation. And I think that, that's an enabler to trigger those things because government wouldn't be in the right fit to do that. So I think that's the... Yes, it was this big open tender, tender process at the beginning, but that then as an enabler uh, for those smaller ones to actually come on board uh, and participate as much as I mentioned earlier. Mm. Matthew, do you, ha do you have companies coming to you looking to try things and test things out uh, with you as that test bed? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, I think it's our challenge to develop a framework and, and this is probably... What we're talking about today is develop a framework in which we can manage um, those people that are coming in and, and uh, understand the level of risk to the university around it, um, testing technologies within our, within our network. Um, we, we support a lot of student-led projects yeah. as well um, with, with financial um, assistance and also mentorship, but, but probably don't have that formal framework in which we can... Um, really effectively do that. So um, th this is quite timely for us from a um, Flinders point of view. We're, we're about to turn up with a whole bunch of more entrepreneurs to, uh, yeah. who want to try things out. Uh, Burkhard, you have been on the, on the startup side of life yeah. and now on the, sort of the, the big company side of things. Uh, a lot of startups say they have a hard time getting through and getting the right yeah. conversation internally now that you're on the inside what's the perspective of the the role of of new tech and and, and new organizations yes yeah, certainly so um i i think the when we look at the startups they sometimes come from a very like um, um, a certain position and i think what is really required is that both the large players or large organizations 
have an understanding of how a startup works and how they think. Um, but it's also required from a startup organization to understand how the large company ticks and how they work. Um, so it's this shared understanding of what each other needs and how they would like to work. Um, so I'm coming back to the energy mining collaboration because this is really a place where we want to encourage the engagement with startup companies um, in particular um, to open up an opportunity for startups to be maybe on a mine site to test their equipment um, and demonstrate what the capability is. Um, I'm coming back to the question that you asked um, Phil before, um, how procurement works usually. So in mining, I think the standard way, and probably generalize a little bit, but um, you've got a problem, you write the scope of work, and you go out for tender, and you hopefully you get the, um, you know, you select someone. Um, in the new world where we sometimes don't know what the actual problem is, mm. we can't write that anymore, it, or it's not clear enough. So we need to be brave enough to go out and say, well, we don't know this, this, and this, so how can you help, or how could you help? Um, in other ways, it's also that um, maybe a startup company comes and says, I've got this really interesting technology, and I think it would be applicable for your mind site. And that's when we, as a, um, as a team, get interested um, to understand what it is and how it could actually be applicable. Is that part of the, the, the organizational setting, is to try and find different answers? Absolutely. To, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. I guess I, I'm running out of time, and I, I really want to come back to you on this, Sam, around South Australia. Uh, what is it about this market? Where, where is the sweet spot of opportunity that should be attracting new ideas and, and entrepreneurs to look at this market? Uh, so I think one really big opportunity is um, with the rate of take-up of solar uh, and yeah. household solar, um, what we're fast approaching is a period in the middle of the day where we have too much energy in the system, so more energy available than the demand. Uh, and it's a real thing. It sounds sort of fanciful, but it is a dangerous thing from an engineering perspective because you can't maintain control of that of the, the grid. So there is, a, I think, an emerging piece of work that you know, a lot of people are looking at. It's not like it's not, but I think that's where the combination of smart technology coming in, we're going to have um, more household batteries than anywhere else in Australia, I think, in the short period of time. We've got a couple of big programs that are working their way you know, into scale um, as that sort of household battery market continues to develop. Uh, so there's sort of going to be a lot of kit out there that people are going to be empowered with. It's a real opportunity, I think, for people then to have the benefit of using that kit, but also for people to put into the market uh, opportunities to capitalise on people being equipped with some storage to help soak up some of the solar. Um, there's a whole lot of other things in, in the world already around like hot water systems and different sort of things that with a little bit of correct technology and some um, coordinated smarts, uh, I think is, is an area that can make a really big difference in South Australia. Uh, and again, perhaps because of where we are, um, the, um, that's where we're going to have the ability to tackle some of those challenges first. So having that sort of focus on South Australia is probably helpful. Yeah. 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 Oh, thank you. I, I feel like we've got a good sense of where the market's at and, and, and the challenges that are coming and, and what that can mean for innovation, where it can actually fit. I'd love to open up to the floor for questions. Sir, in the... Sir, that's a very generous description. <laughs> um, why don't you get involved and um, other questions I can get from all that. Thank you. Prominent mine, or Prominent Hill, you said there was gold and um, copper there. <coughs> Have you looked at any uranium or thorium in that and thought about small-scale nuclear um, generation of power? The other one was the uh, Simon Hackett's um, storage with zinc bromide. Has anyone looked at that, that scale? Thank you. Mm -hmm. but anyone answer, answer in any order? doesn't really matter. Who wants to try that? You can first off. Okay. So... The small-scale nuclear is an, is an interesting technology. Um, it's, 
as part of the function I'm in, something that we're tracking, we're looking at. Um, it, there's nothing there yet at this stage where I say, oh, this is applicable. Um, so we track it and we look at it, absolutely. Uh, I had a little bit of a uh, to do with the zinc bromide batteries. Uh, I think they are, you know, it's pretty exciting. It's a different model. It seems to be more suitable for commercial industrial scale, um, just with the size and the, the ability, the time storage that it enables. Um, but there are some applications for household. Uh, I think that um, the national standards are, are sort of um, have really lined up around lithium iron at the moment, and I think there's a piece of work that some other battery um, examples are working on at the moment to, to get involved in that. And once that's in place, I think that's going to make it a lot easier for those different batteries to be able to get into some of the programs that are around nationally as well. But it's it, it's pretty exciting. I know there's a lot of um, it's starting to get a lot of uses in different aspects. Household probably less, but a lot of commercial industrial fronts. It is interesting that. Um the storage narrative has really been owned by lithium ion um, and I guess that's to a degree the, the sort of the Tesla narrative and what we see with the EVs uh, but the diversity of opportunities to bring different storage on for different challenges is is significant and I think it also opens up new manufacturing opportunities as well it's the the whole building out of this industry and, and, and you mentioned pumped hydro um, and I assume you're just doing that to, to, to load balance out the, the, the daytime generation. Absolutely. Yep. Is there a view on nuclear in this state? Is there a firm view on nuclear? Uh, Going back to your old job, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, there, well, there was a, um, we had a Royal Commission into the opportunities for the nuclear industry um, two years ago, finished up oh, okay. two years ago. So there was a really extensive piece of work done. A lot of the discussion focused on the potential for a waste um, storage and processing industry, yep. but there was a very detailed per piece of work done about nuclear energy in there, uh, and it concluded at the time that um, it's it's in the future potentially there, but not a, a near-term scenario. Um, but you know there is a really impressive detailed body of work which was was done around that. So we're sort of well placed mm. to to look at it, and and on the back of that, I'm sure it is on the radar of a lot of the the bigger companies, but the, gen the view at that point in time was it's a bit further out, okay. yeah. Just before you go, I've still got the microphone, so sorry guys. <laughs> the, um, the other thing was Clearview, the generation of power through uh, plain glass windows. There's an organisation or company in WA, I think it's a spin out of one of the universities over there that take the infrared and the ultraviolet and run it off through a membrane off to the side of the, uh, uh, the panels and generate um, power. Has, this is more for UniSA because I was talking to Colin Sterling last year about his piece of kit that he's chucked out there. Any thoughts on that? And I'll give it away now, sorry. Um, no, I, I think it's, it's challenging to ask the panel to, to drill onto a particular specific technology that they're not necessarily up to speed on. I might save that for discussion um, over a glass of wine if that's all right. You happy with that? Uh, have we got another question? Sir? It's coming. coming. It's coming. <laughs> um, Graham Davies. I've um, got a couple of hats, companies, resident solutions, but I'm also on the Engineers Australia National Energy Panel. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll just, I wanted to ask a question, but I'll, because of the nuclear, I'll go to that first. Is it's expensive, simple bottom line. It's and got a whole long, long development times. Long too, development it? times. It's, yeah. It's really is in pipe dream area. I've asked the uh, guys on the nuclear side, put some numbers on the table, not adjectives. <laughs> and so, yeah. so really I think the best is you're looking at about 25 cents a kilowatt hour for nuclear in South Australia. It's just nowhere near the wind and solar, which can be five or six or seven. Um, if you add on storage, you're a little, little bit higher. So really it's a long way off. Thorium was 20 years away when I was a student, it's still 20 years away. So is mm. Gen 4, so is everything. 20 years means it's, it's kind of dreaming stuff. Fusion, if, fusion 20 <laughs> years away as well, same thing. Um, it's, it's Gen 4, I'd love to see working because it absorbs the waste. But I want to get on to the question, you said the na national energy market's working. 
And I, I look at, it depends on how you define working. Yes, we get electricity, and yes, every year we have met the, the, the needs. But I don't think working is an adequate way of describing 35 cents plus a kilowatt hour. When we've got abundant energy sources in South Australia, I think it's actually quite problematic. And I think that's why you're taking things in-house. And that's why it's actually good for consumers to put in solar, you know, solar and so on. So yes. Agree. Um, so it, it actually um, comes to the point of why we're focused so much on the demand side in terms of both creating that flexibility, but also all the work that we do through Zen Energy in terms of giving residential customers the ability to have solar and battery at their home. So that's absolutely there. Um, but back to Sam's point earlier, I think it really comes down to how South Australia taps into the eastern seaboard in terms of what is the, the national electricity market in terms of the interconnectors and, and how constrained they are in terms of the price disparity that does happen at times. Um, but at the end of the day, a market is, you know, in, in economic terms, defined by optimising the difference between supply and demand. And there's many ways you can get about that. They all have a cost involved. Um, and, and it's about finding the way and, and, I guess, diversity of solutions that exist to be able to create that balance, which delivers low cost prices um, consistently, reliably into the future. And that's what we're trying to help solve. Yeah, it's not, it's not an immediate answer uh, to my earlier point, but um, I think the fact that, you know, the grid is in a, a reliable state and it does what it needs to do to get more generators online at different times and those sorts of things, I, I would say it is working in the way it was originally designed to work. Whether that works into the future is, is why all of this new energy innovation exists. Yeah. I'd ask for the opportunities. <laughs> It is interesting with a cha rapidly changing market, it does drive engagement and does ask questions that need to be answered as opposed to sort of lumbering along as it did for, for such a long time beforehand. Uh, another question? It's me. Hey, he's already got a microphone. Hi, my name is Keith Jones from South Australian Government, uh, Department of Trade, Tourism and Investment. I was interested in the negative prices when the wind's out, and I, I'm, my understanding is this happens in Queensland too with the coal-fired power stations, it's too expensive to turn them down, so they wear the loss. In terms of investment attraction, where do you see the investment coming with wind if you're going to be getting a lot less prices from those wind, um, um, those wind resources, and therefore change you know, the payback? Um, investors may look to invest somewhere else where they can get a higher return for, uh, for wind. Where do you see us making advancements in maintaining our growth in, in wind and perhaps other renewables when the demand, the prices will go down, which could impact on investment? It feels like you, Sam. <laughs> um, so I think, I think the, the ideal goal, and I think we're rapidly moving towards it, is to be able to harness the renewables and um, firm them in a way with storage to be able to provide industrial contracts and therefore capitalise on the cheap renewables, um, pay the little bit of a, a premium you need to pay to be able to cover the gaps that they're not available, and then to be able to contract that into the industrial market. And I think that's part of Symex plan and there's a range of um, people that are looking at sort of cracking that if you like and, and getting the right mix and being able to do that. That then unlocks um, a a real new energy opportunity for South Australia. So it's harnessing our renewables um, and been doing that in there. So part of the issue with our pricing um, has really been that we've had lack of competition for th in the contract market since Northern exited. So we've had really only a few players that can provide those contracts over time. And I think what we're starting to see is a range of other people now who are building up the assets and the generation assets that can enable them to compete. And the more that involves the renewables, that we can capitalise on the cheaper nature there, then that's going. So if you're starting to get renewables as part of a long-term contract with industry or in, in off-track arrangements or different sort of supply arrangements, then your renewable projects are going to become more valuable. So I think it's, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think that it's uh, a concern about the, the value diminishing for them. It's about um, working the pathway to be able to capitalise on it. Um, uh, because, of course, um, as the cost of 
implement building those projects continues to come down with technology and innovation, larger wind turbines and solar and uh, and all of that, you're seeing that and you don't have to pay for a fuel source compared to other generation. So the upfront cost that's associated now is becoming really competitive with all forms of generation. So therefore, capitalising on that wind and solar resource is, is always going to be going forward and an affordable and probably the most affordable way to generate. Um, the trick is getting the contracting and, and firming it up to be able to contract reliably in the market. So you want to, sorry. You've answered it very well. <laughs> uh, one last question. Uh, so yeah, Neil McFarlane again from the government, uh, working um, in climate change actually. So um, just a comment and then a question. Um, I think you're underselling actually what's happened in South Australia. It's absolutely amazing that we have, what, 56% renewable now, Sam, around there for the state, going up to 75%. I mean, Victoria, Queensland, New South Wales, they're nowhere near this. So miles ahead on the renewable uh, um, uh, mix. Um, and that's why overseas are so interested in it, because that's, you know, no other state really has that kind of what's going on here. So that's why there's a whole lot of interest in it. Um, but what you're forgetting also is the emissions side of it. And none of you have mentioned about how, you know, in South Australia now we are 39% less emissions than we were than 2005, which is amazing as well. So it's been driven by the renewable energy and that's driving others to go in and then we'll do transport because we'll get EV. So it's the driver for emissions reduction as well. So the panel needs, I think, to, to recognise that. Um, but I have a question on particularly the energy um, um, companies. Will they, if we go into EVs in a big way, so not just hundreds, I'm talking thousands, you know, in the future, 5, 10, 15, 20 years, I have two questions. How does that impact on the grid? Because if you're going to have a lot of people going home and plugging their cars in at home, how does that, does that have major impacts on the grid? And how do you plan for that? And secondly, what will happen to all the petroleum companies? Are they all going to go into energy now? I mean, is BP and Shell, are they just going to come in uh, and also the role of, say, Origin Energy or um, AGL, are they all going to be out there having charging stations? Absolutely, I think is the answer. <laughs> um, so Shell are already moving very quickly into the energy space at the minute. They're buying companies left, right and centre so that they can be up and running in the energy space because they're already seeing exactly, exactly what you are. Um, but to your first point around electric vehicles, I think um, absolutely it could become an issue, but um, I guess we have the benefit of the experience of the solar example and seeing what that's done to the, to the load shape over a day um, to be able to sort of plan in advance and, and harness the technology that is becoming more and more available at the minute to optimise the way that those electric vehicles are used as they enter the market. So essentially it, it's a battery on wheels and if you have the ability to time when during the day you're charging and discharging that battery, um, then it can have a minimal impact on the grid. Um, you know, there's, there's times where there is that excess of generation in the middle of the day where, you know, most people are already at their, their place of work or they're at home, so the car is stationary during those hours where there's that excess of energy that we see existing with, with so much solar in, in the market that it's a perfect time of day to be charging up your electric vehicle. So again, it, it comes to the point where I think South Australia is the perfect place to be, to be pushing those technologies and, and learning from that to take it into other markets as well. Yeah, it's certainly an area that, that CIMEC and GFG are looking at very closely. I think there's a consensus that the EVs will ultimately be a greater asset to the grid if they can be successfully managed than a, than a detraction. Yeah. Yeah, gonna, we are looking at installing some charging stations uh, this year and um, we, we have 5,000 car parks at Flinders Uni, so mm -hmm. we're you know, looking at is there an opportunity for us to soak up some of that additional generation through the, through the, through the day, you know, does that provide some value to the, the network and, um, and also to, to those people who will have EVs in the future. Yep. Anyone else want to pick up on that or we'll wrap it up? Um, please join me in thanking our panel for a fabulous discussion. <laughs> <laughs>